Exploring the Mind, When Counting Doesn't Count, The Development of Math Skills in Young Children, in partnership with the U of M Department of Psychology. So today I'm going to talk about, I have quite a lot of lines of research um, that I look at, but today I'm going to talk about the work I've done on math achievement, and it ends up being we're in a very appropriate room because this is the old school board room where the school, school board of Ann Arbor uh, met. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the issues of schooling. In fact, I'm going to do a little bit of a developmental walkthrough, um, looking at math uh, all the way from the home environment into the schooling environment and even transition to college and talk a little bit about the research that we do. Uh, first, because this gets lost a lot toward the end, I want to thank um, all the people I work with. My two primary collaborators on math have been Mane Susperigi and Alexa Ellis. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Alexa's work, which is our newest work that we're doing um, toward the end of the presentation. And my lab uh, that helps on all of these, even though they all do different things, um, we all pull together and look over things. Uh, and many of them have helped me with my, my beautiful um, bar graphs as well. Um, so when I was growing up and we had four stations on TV, we had, uh, and I couldn't see one of them because CBS uh, could not, with our antenna, could not get to my house. Um, we had kind of an intervention that went on. It went on for both reading and for math that was called Schoolhouse Rock. Um, and lots of kids, if you start singing, and I had a video, but it's uh, not working, so I will briefly sing for you <laughs> the math one that I had. Um, but all kids who watch cartoons every morning on Saturday got to see Schoolhouse Rock. Uh, many of us sing things that we know, like conjunction, junction from that. And the one that I had up here was the one for fives, counting fives, which went 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. So you'll hear people of my age when you start singing that also join in and sing along to the Schoolhouse Rock. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about today about how we can think about interventions and the type of interventions uh, we need to consider for math, because math achievement in this country is problematic. And I'm going to show you some slides here. It's, this is a list, and I'm sorry it's so small, but of a bunch of countries. And you don't really need to see what the countries are other than Singapore's at the top, as they always are on these international tests that we have. This is called the PISA, uh, and it's an international test of achievement across all the countries that participate. Uh, and in science, we're kind of in the middle, which is good to know. Uh, in reading, kind of similarly in the, in the middle. Uh, but for math, we're quite a bit lower, and in a place competing with groups that we don't actually think we compete with, like Pakistan, Bulgaria. Um, so we're doing pretty poorly international uh, for the math, but we also have some issues nationally. So all the kids in the United States uh, participate uh, at different schools in the NAEP test, the National Assessment of Education Progress. Um, this is a standardized test that's given. All the kids receive exactly the same items uh, across the United States. And it's pulled together, and every year um, the Institute for Educational Sciences puts together a report. This is actually from Pew Organization that shows the progress, and this is the progress for math. And if you can see, um, and unfortunately I can't walk away or use my pointer uh, because I'm being filmed, so I will point and hope you can see where I'm pointing to, that the fourth graders have gotten better over time. This is good news. Um, if you look at that very top one, that's the advanced, and that's in 1990, 1% of fourth graders were in, considered in an advanced category for math. That's improved to 7% uh, in 2015. Uh, the concern, though, is that we were generally on a, a, a fairly upward, if you can go 7 to 8 as being an upward trajectory, it's not bad. Um, but now in the last 2015 iteration of this, we started to see a decrease in math that was unexpected. Um, this is a decrease. At the same time, we have interventions in almost every school. Um, one of the major changes in curriculum was to move to something called everyday math. Uh, so if you're in the Ann Arbor Public Schools, your kids are getting everyday math, which is an estimation type of math. Uh, and we didn't see 
the math increase. So both during the Bush administration and the Obama administration, there have been really big education programs and interventions and money pouring into schools to make a difference both on reading but especially on math. Um, and they haven't had an impact. In fact, not only have they not had an impact, it looks like we're going in the wrong direction. But I will point out that for basic skills, just to, this, it's not all a terrible story. We went from, well, in eighth grade, it, it's not a great story. We went from 37 to 38, but in fourth grade, we actually went up to 42% in basic skills in math. So, um, so there was some increase. It just isn't the kind of increase you, we wanted or that you would hope for. So some of the things that we know about math. Why are we talking about, why do we care about math? Um, some of you may not know this, but math is the critical skill that's looked at for college admissions. Um, many people can read uh, pretty well that are applying for college, and math is one of the distinctive skills that they look at. Um, and so it, and it's important because we found out that math skills, it's not just taking calculus, basic math skills, are one of the best predictors of whether or not you have a college education, go on um, and get higher than a high school diploma. That uh, it's also, this is from an economist, Murnam, that, um, that they're also linked to higher wages. So the higher your math skills are, the more you make across time. And then uh, in a, a study by Greg Duncan, who's also an economist, using US and international data sets, it ends up being that early math achievement is the strongest predictor of later math skills. So um, we think a lot about in high school, where you're taking algebra, calculus, geometry, and other classes as being kind of this jumping off point to college, but it's actually quite a bit earlier than that. Um, it's really at the basic skills level. That has been um, the point in time that we've intervened, but I'm going to show you today that um, even though we're, we're intervening, uh, we may not actually be intervening on exactly the right thing. So this is work that I've done looking at math achievement trajectories. You hear a lot about achievement gaps, and people talk about what they are. Uh, and this is research, and I'm going to show you, um, this is from a national data set. There's, um, it's called the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study. It's a population representative data set, which means that when we find something in this data set, we can generalize it to the population because it's sampled that way. Um, and this is just looking at those of European American background. Um, and if my pointer worked, I would show you <laughs> that at this lowest, at, and this is K at entry, so at entry within the first few months of entering school, we already have a significant gap. This is something that you don't hear a lot about. Uh, we talk about the gaps increasing over schooling, but the gaps actually don't increase over schooling. They kind of hold the same and about the same entry. And so what it tells us is that what you come in with is pretty much where you stay. We have some groups that what are called catch-up groups that um, kind of change around first grade and then hold steady. But basically, the gap stays the same and just widens over time. So we end up having the lowest achievers hardly growing or moving at all, and the highest achievers really staying in exactly the same place. These gaps exist for all race groups in the United States that we've looked at. Um, we have high achievers in all groups, and we have low achievers they start off uh, already separated at kindergarten, and it just continues to grow over time. The only group that seems to be reducing by the time uh, they're in high school, or I'm sorry, fifth grade, uh, are the Asian groups. So this is the achievement gap that you've heard about. Uh, what I want to stress with these pictures is this is not a gap that's created by the schools. It's a gap that's held steady. It already exists upon entry to schools. Um, Patty talked a little bit about my socioeconomic status background. That I look at parents' educational attainment. This highly predicts who's in these groups. So the higher your education, the higher your income, the more likely you are to be in the highest achieving groups, which means those socio-demographic variables pretty much hold steady achievement. So it's not just what you've learned in school. It's also what you came into school with. So early skills are important, and they're complicated. So reading, which... Um, my colleague Fred Morrison did a talk here, I think, yeah, two years ago maybe, on, um, on reading. 
Uh, we had what was classically called the reading wars, and this is where there was arguments between whether or not you needed phonics prior to whole word skills. So did you, were you capable of sounding out a word, or was it just, here's a cat, call this cat, and you just named the, the, what the element was. That's whole word, right? Um, so it was pretty much decided, even though there's skirmishes that still go on, little battles here and there, but it was pretty much decided that um, phonics is a foundational skill that you need to be able to sound out words. And if you are incapable of sounding out those words, then you're really going to struggle to ever read well. Um, and if you uh, come into school already knowing phonics, then the whole word curriculum works for you because you already can do it. If you don't, then you actually struggle with reading until you go back and learn the basics in phonics. We're right in the middle, deep in the middle of math wars. Um, so we haven't figured out, and, and unlike reading, which is, um, there's still issues of literacy. I'm not going to say that, that we've solved the issue of literacy because we have not. Um, but it has, most of our interventions are actually working, and kids who come in with reading issues are actually reading at grade level or above uh, by the time they make it through elementary school. This isn't the case for math. Um, so we have the kind of war that's going on. It's a little bit complicated, but it's between basic skills. So memorization of multiplication tables is an example of what we call basic skills, learning to add, um, knowing what the basic equal sign is, um, something that with uh, the current math systems falling out, many of you might remember that you learn to carry the one. Kids no longer learn to carry, um, they estimate. Um, so we don't, that's no longer one of the things you look at, but, but it's a basic skill. And this is versus problem solving. It really is estimation and problem solving on the idea that if you learn how to problem solve through estimation, you'll be able to use those skills to solve much more difficult math problems later on. Um, the problem is when they've evaluated everyday math, they've literally found no difference in math compared to those through traditional math. So they have looked at multiple evaluations, and we see no change uh, in math skills. So um, I will say, it doesn't matter if we found no differences. Um, we still uh, are arguing over it. Some of it is that we don't have the equivalent of phonics in math yet. We still have people arguing over what are kind of the primary building blocks of math. And so we don't know, like we do with literacy, that, that phonics is one of the kind of primary skills you need. We don't know what that is for math, and so we're still looking for that. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, uh, and I'm going to show you some slides today about what we kind of know so far from the research we've done. All right, so I want to admit that I'm a developmental psychologist, so I take a developmental view, and I want to talk a little bit wh about why this is important. Um, when kids go to school, this idea that you develop at different rates, which is pretty predominant in the preschool environment, that there are kids that get motor skills at different times, kids walk differently. This is a very developmental concept. Um, when we go into the schools, we start getting to what you're proficient at by the end of a grade. So you should be at this point at the end of kindergarten. You should be at this point at the end of first grade. That's a non-developmental way of thinking about achievement. So even though these kids have different skills coming in, and we saw that in the achievement gap pictures I showed you, um, all of the kids are supposed to be at the same point by the time they finish a grade. We know that kids are learning at all different rates when they come into school. They have different backgrounds when they're coming in. They have things that they're missing. But that entire developmental way of thinking goes out the window to everyone needing to be at the same place at the same time as they transition through every single school. So I'm going to talk developmentally about the way we think about it, which is how does math matter in the home, which is what's being developed that you're bringing in or not developed as you come into the schools. What does it matter for your transition to schooling, which is a very important part, and if you may remember, has been the target of much of the intervention, which uh, using the term school ready, are you school ready? There's lots of um, tests out there that are school readiness tests to determine that. How does it matter why you're in schooling? What are the important skills you need? How does it matter for long-term schooling outcomes going on to college, either two-year or four-year? Uh, and then where should we be intervening? Is there any place that we should be intervening to change these gaps that we're seeing um, 
both at the beginning and all the way through the end. So I'm going to start by talking about math talk in the home. So I have a, a colleague who I've done some research with who said to me when we started this, you don't learn math in the home. No one learns math until they get to school. And I always said, not true, because we can see these achievement gaps. So they're learning it from somewhere. So of course, they're learning math prior um, to starting school. Uh, so we did a study um, to look at how families talk about math at home. So just like with reading, you read to your child, you talk a lot, you converse with your child, you're passing on language. This is how kids learn language. This is how they learn the skills. Uh, you're reading to them. And you're also counting and showing them numbers along the way, right? Lots of books in this library have counting involved in them when you read to your kids, right? How does math talk in naturalistic context vary across families of different socioeconomic backgrounds? So we are also interested in that to see if in the home different groups are talking uh, about certain kinds of math concepts and not others, and whether or not there are frequency differences just in general. So we use this recorder the talk pedometer that one of my students came up with. Talk pedometer, basically, we put it on a child, we turn it on, and for 16 hours, we listen to the conversations and record the conversations in the home. We then bring these recordings back, and in this study, we did it for three days. So these families, these kids would put on little t-shirts that had little pockets in them. They would wear these little recorders, and we would listen to what they're hearing, and we put them on the mo mother so we could hear what she was saying, because sometimes if she got too far away, we couldn't hear what she was saying, just so we could do this. This is a very time-intensive coding effort to get 16 hours uh, and to look at what parents are saying about numbers. This is the general method that we used. Uh, we did this as a two time point study. So we had um, the recorders on at wave one. And then we looked to see whether or not it mattered how much math the parents were saying in the home to the achievement a year later. So we wanted to see if there was any prediction from that. Um, these kids were about four years old. They were mostly boys. It, you know, when we do these kind of studies, we have to go out into the community and recruit. Uh, people to be in our studies, and for whatever reason, more people put their boys in the study than girls. It's kind of unusual. We mostly have girls in our studies. Uh, so this was different in the fact that um, parents wanted more of their kids in. Four hours of conversation. So we had 16 hours, but you're not always talking to each other uh, during that time. So we had to isolate the time points when parents and kids were actually having conversation. Our guess before going in and doing this was that this was going to be after dinner while you're playing with your child. Um, it was an unrealistic guess. It was this kind of beautiful, what do you see on TV? When do parents and kids interact? It ends up being that most of the time they're talking are between breakfast and dinner. So kids and parents do most of their conversation around food um, and talking and that. So we were able to isolate four hours of the conversation around breakfast and dinner when we saw most of what we call these conversational turns when the parent or child ask a question and then there's an answer back. Um, we did two days that were transcribed at the utterance level. I, I won't get into that too much, but it's different from a word. Um, and it's just one of the ways that we try to understand the language in the home. Um, we looked at number of exchanges, type, length, and complexity, and these were all the things we coded, whether or not they named numbers, dates, fractions, comparing things, measuring things, shapes, printing. We looked at anything that could possibly, and actually this is based on previous research that others have found, are the things parents and kids talk about in the home. So this is the frequency that we found these topics. By and large, Kids prior to schooling, most of the parents are naming numbers. 48% of anything we hear that has to do with math is naming numbers. Uh, then these kind of ordinal numbers, one, two, three, four, time, counting, uh, and then 4% fractions. It's interesting, the fractions comes in. Do you, do you have some thoughts? Do you think about where fractions comes in between kids? Yeah. Yeah, it's um, cooking and it's setting the table and it's cutting up things. Um, you know, you need to uh, give half to your brother. What's half? You know, that type of thing. Yeah. Exactly. So it's all around splitting up stuff and sharing stuff. Uh, and then just we need a half a cup. So what's a half a cup look like? Right? So that's where all the fractions were coming in. Doesn't happen often, but that's when it was fractions, that's where it was coming in. 
So this was the complexity. So let me tell you what this is. So math talk is the MT here. So how complex was it? Here we were looking at basic skills like counting uh, ordinal numbers versus something like fractions, which was higher order, taking things away, subtraction, which for this age group would be uh, more difficult. Who initiated it? This is kind of interesting. The mother generally initiated math talk. When we look at reading, it totally flips. It's the kid that generally initiates reading. They'll say, can you read this to me? Can you read this book? We were somewhat surprised by that. We thought the parents would also be initiating the reading, but it's actually the kid that initiates reading. But the parents seem to initiate the, the math talk. And then who dominated it? Generally the mother for mostly basic skills. So this is what we heard in these eight hours of um, coding. So the proportion of math talk in families from different education levels. This was one of the primary questions of our study. Uh, we wanted to know whether or not it mattered if uh, you had less than a bachelor's degree or higher than a bachelor's degree. And what we see is that, in general, it's pretty consistent across group with naming numbers being slightly higher uh, in the bachelor's only group, um, I mean, above bachelor group, and then fractions. The real dominance was that those who have higher than a bachelor's uh, degree are, are doing more fractions and talking about more fractions in the home. Um, and counting is dominating in the households uh, with less than a bachelor's degree. So what did we find out? So then we predicted, as I said, to achievement a year later to see whether or not any of this coding of what the parents were saying in the home mattered for later achievement. Now these children are getting ready to tra transition to school. These are the skills that they're going to take with them. And what did we find? We found that counting didn't matter at all, doesn't predict to anything um, as far as later achievement. But doing any of the higher order skills like fractions or subtractions did predict to later achievement skills. And that's controlling for the parents' education and income levels. So we have that controlled in the study. This is consistent with other works of colleagues of mine at, at University of Chicago who have looked at this large scale study I showed you with the achievement gap. They looked to see what skills kids had as they entered into kindergarten. Surprisingly, I think even to them, 88% of the kids were competent and proficient already in counting. But the primary skill that you learn in kindergarten is counting. You spend an entire year learning counting of which most of the kids in the classroom are proficient in. If you were in a classroom that did slightly above those kind of skills, addition or subtraction, you saw that those kids actually did better uh, in schooling later. And that's what they found from the, the kindergarten one. So it's consistent that uh, higher SES kids are already coming in, they're already proficient, they're, they're already capable of moving forward. Even kids from the lower socioeconomic, uh, I say SES all the time, but I'm trying to say socioeconomic status. Um, also no counting, uh, but they're not being taught anything but counting. It's not to say that there aren't kids who do not know how to count, and I'm going to show you that we do have those kind of kids, but uh, primarily most of the kids, and this is 88% of the population of those entering school already know how to count. So counting doesn't matter. It's a primary, you'll, you'll hear teachers talking about it, but it's, it's not something that's important. All right, so now what about play in the home? So we talked about what parents are doing as far as talking. What about what they're actually interacting with their kids about? Anyone recognize this? I have the name up there. It shoots and ladders. So there's two games that you play with very young children in the home. Primarily, there's others. Um, but you play shoots and ladders and Candyland. And there's a distinction between these two that most people don't think about. But um, one of my colleagues used it to his advantage to do an experiment. Uh, on shoots and ladders, it's a 1 to 100 scale board. You have to go forward. And you have to count backwards during the game. And then, you know, then there's the all horrible shoot that you have to get that takes you all the way back down to 24. Kids count one, two, three, four as you go forward, and they count backwards, right? So parents use this a lot for doing that. Candyland, you flip the spinner and you move to the next color. So you learn colors and you learn to move to those colors, but the only action you need in there is to know colors to move forward, so no counting involved. So in this case, what do you learn for math? The number of discrete movements from the child is made, amount of numbers, names the child has spoken. They actually see it in what's almost a number line, so they can see what's bigger and what's smaller. 
the whole thing goes up so that 100's at the top, so that you see it at the top. Uh, and then the distance and the time spent playing the game, right? Um, so it's a pretty good visual, spatial, auditory, temporal cues. There's a lot going on with shoots and ladders you may not have known when you were playing it. Just fun, right? So what Bob Siegler, who's at Carnegie Mellon, did was that he decided to take uh, and see whether or not it mattered for kids' math skills if you played shoots and ladders or if you played Candyland. So he created his own um, kind of scoreboard, one to 10 with young kids. He had colors and numbers on them. And he called it the great race, rabbit and bear, because we can't actually use shoots and ladders in Candyland. Um, so he created this, pretty short. He did exactly the same thing. The only thing he did was take out the numbers. So then it's just colors. So the boards are exactly the same, only change numbers. He had 124 low income children. Um, he did a pretest at the beginning to find out what their math what ability was. Then they played the game. Then he found out what it looked like afterwards for being able to name numbers and count. And then nine weeks later, he went back in to see whether or not to also test the math skills again to see whether or not they had retained anything or if it was just this momentary thing. I played shoots and ladders and for the minute I kind of had this bump in what I understood, but it faded out, went away. It was four 15-minute sessions, not much, over two weeks, uh, and then the nine weeks post-test. So this is what he found. So if you play the number board game, um, which was equivalent to shoots and ladders, and I think it's called snakes and something and another, has many names actually, uh, or Candyland, uh, at pre-test there was already some differences, which is a little bit weird since this was random, but there were some differences. Post-test it started to pull apart, and nine weeks later they retained what they knew when they were looking at numbers. So number identification, is that a two? Or tell me what this number is. Tell me what this number is. They were able to do it for counting. They also, numerical magnitude comparison. And the only thing was on the number line, at follow-up, it began to fade out. So it didn't help them for the nine weeks after, but they saw an original increase of the number line, remembering that shoots and nodders looks a little bit like a number line. Um, right afterwards. So this gave some indication that shoots and ladders and the games that you play uh, are actually also having a positive impact on kids' math. They're learning numbers, they're learning placement, they're learning the magnitude, the difference between a five and a one, uh, and they're also figuring out one to a hundred, which thing comes in the middle, which things comes first, which thing comes last. All right, so just so you know, I'm gonna, I told Bob, he believes me now, that parents are doing things in the home, kids have skills coming in to the schools, they have differential skills, some of them know how to do things, some of them don't. A lot of it has to do with what parents are doing, what they're saying, what they're playing, and the actions that they do in the home. So now, what about transition to schooling? So this is a collaboration I'm working on with Alexa Ellis uh, and others from UNC and uh, UT Austin. Um, we're bringing together all these developmental scholars to try to look at are there differences in what math skills children have entering school, and this is a big one, does it predict a college attendance? So we're looking at kids at 54 months prior to entry to school. This is a longitudinal data set. It's a birth one, so we know everything about them from the time they were born all the way to age 15 and beyond. We know actually what college, if they applied to college and attended. 1,300 kids that have been followed all of that time. Um, it's not representative like some of the other data sets, but it is across the United States. So it's across the states of the, the United States. Um, and so what we really wanted to know is, are there kids that are coming in with clusters of different math skills that matter to how they're gonna do in school? And the answer is yes. So we had a group in this, uh, of these kids who had no skills coming in at all. They couldn't even count, so they had no skills. Uh, we had a group that could only count, but nothing else. We had a group, interestingly, that could count and subtract, but not add. We've actually seen some replication of that. For some reason, kids, some kids get subtraction before they get addition. Uh, and then we had counting, subtraction, and adding. So at 54 months, we found all of these groups showing that kids have quite differential math skills right before school entry. Uh, and that's, that's important to know. Um, then we went to predict what was the highest math 
course they took. So we had all of their courses that they took in high school. So we were able to go in and find out whether they took a calculus, advanced math, algebra two, geometry, or algebra one. In the United States right now, uh, which isn't true in other countries, uh, when I went through school, we tracked kids. Uh, I knew, for example, when I went into high school that I was on college track. They mentioned that over and over again. You're on college track, therefore you must take these classes because you're on college track. We now have, um, we don't use the term track, but that same system is still here informally in the United States very clearly. I don't know if you guys know this, if your kid is taking Algebra 1 at 8th grade, that means they're going to be tracked on the college track. Uh, it ends up being Algebra 1 in junior high is one of the biggest things, you, kind of things you have to get over to know whether or not you can get to calculus by 12th. It used to be Algebra 1 in ninth grade, so it's actually changed. It's starting to go down. Most of the schools in Ann Arbor uh, have Algebra 1 in eighth grade, and it's the tracking year. That will determine pretty much what you do in math thereafter in high school. If you had no skills coming in, your highest school math was generally algebra. So you got as far as algebra one by 11th grade. Uh, similar for counting, if that was the only skill you had coming in. But if you had counting, subtracting, and adding, you were very likely, and that's about 80%, are in advanced math and calculus. So again, having those skills at 54 months prior to school entry, we were able to see these differences in what classes these kids took, very similar to the achievement trajectories I showed you of the gap early on, that kids are just holding these differences that they start school with. They're not really switching. We did have, you know, there is good news. Some people did switch, but not a lot, not a lot. Now we want to know whether or not knowing your skills at 54 months, does it predict college attendance? And it does. So kids who had pretty high skills, counting, subtracting, and adding, um, were most likely to go to a four-year college. Counting and subtracting also did well, and even no skills, but at a much lower rate. So this is about 25% uh, versus about 75% of the kids going in counting, subtracting, and adding. Um, and the no-skill groups were most likely to end up in a two-year college, but only about 40%. So again, coming in with no skills was a huge, huge predictor of every kind of math thing thereafter, including going to college, just by knowing what they did at 54 months. This even surprised us, I have to say. We were shocked to see that. All right, what about schooling? So now you're in school. What is the primary skill that you need to have? So this was an interesting study that came about, um, that came to my group from uh, Bob Siegler, who I showed you his work earlier. He was sitting on a National Academy of Mathematics group, and they were writing up what have become these kind of proficiency ideas of, you know, what are the most important skills you have to have and need to teach. And so at this uh, Academy of Science meeting, someone said, well, you know you have to have fractions to do algebra. So you need to have fractions by third or fourth grade to do algebra. Um, then everyone looked up, got on Google Scholar to look up that seminal article that said you have to have fractions in order to do algebra. And it ends up being there was literally no research on that. Someone somewhere along the way had said, well, of course you have to have fractions in order to do algebra. And it just became known with no research backing it up. So he asked whether or not my group, who was doing these large-scale analyses of educational data sets, could actually look at that and uh, find out whether or not it was true. Do you need to have fractions prior to, going, uh, prior to algebra? Is it a foundational skill for algebra? Uh, so we looked at it for elementary school students' fraction knowledge, um, individual differences in elementary school um, to their total math knowledge. Uh, it ended up being that we were able to use a data set from the UK. Uh, it's called the Ausback data set, as well as the US Panel Study of Income Dynamics, which is a population study, which means we can generalize to the population if we look at that. They had, um, both of them had ways for us to measure addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and fractions, because we wanted to see uh, if it's not fractions, what else could it be? What else is a foundational skill that you might need to have uh, for this? And for example, I might have said, you need multiplication to do algebra. I might just throw that out there, that, you need, that that would be a foundational skill for doing that. 
And also here you can see we took into consideration children's IQ, um, parents' education, family income. We're all, and they're actually much more. We're also controlled in this. One of the reasons we do this, I do a lot of work on replications to, to show whether or not my findings replicate than more than just my study. We want it to replicate it in a US sample and the British sample, basically to see does the British uh, education system do a better job than the US education system. Uh, because they actually do have a very formalized tracking system in the, in the UK. Um, so what did we find? In England, we found um, that addition, subtraction, and multiplication uh, were not primary uh, predictors, but fractions were. Bob was happy, but we also picked up division. Um, in this case, in both of the studies, division um, was assessed by long division. Not simple division, but long division. And we think that was one of the big differences. We don't know why um, division, which is a form of fraction, just throwing that out there, um, why it was that it also, independent of fractions, um, was predictive. But we think it's the complexity of what the kids were doing. So it was just really getting at this complexity. In the US, it looks the same because it totally replicated. So as I tell people, whatever the US does well or badly, the UK does well or badly as well. And it doesn't matter if you have a formalized tracking or an informal. It seems to be exactly the same predictors in both countries. Um, I didn't put the numbers up here, but um, the effect sizes are almost exactly the same in each country. So this seems to be a much more universal issue of fundamental math skills that we're looking at. Just wanted to go back and, and note that only 4% of the kids coming out of our earlier study were hearing fractions prior to entering school. So it's not even that they could do them, but that they were actually hearing them uh, in their home environment. So it's it, third and fourth grade, uh, which are the times of which fractions are introduced, ends up being critical. So most of the research, most of the education ways that we train is that uh, high-end skills in math are trained in high school. But if you don't train these earlier, then you're not going to get to that high school math. So that's kind of the big shift we've talked about in my lab is that we need to think about when you're going to be teaching these. And it needs to be consistent across math. Um, and I just want to ask this question if anyone knows. So if you're doing badly in math in first grade, so I can ask about reading too. But if you're doing badly in first grade, what does the schools do to help you? They do hold you back. <laughs> what do they do for reading if you can't read by first grade? You get a ton of support for reading. You have reading teachers. Um, you're pulled out. Unfortunately, and I will say this because I don't think it's a great policy, Michigan's moving to a, a also holding back if by third grade you can't read. Um, I will say that because it's totally predicted by socioeconomic status. That's why I think it's a poor policy. But um, in math, you get nothing. If you do poorly in math in first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, you just pass forward because it's not considered one of those critical skills. And I'll come back to that at the end of what's happened to math. Why do we think math is different than reading? But if you can't read, you will be intervened on. Your kid will be pulled out and go to reading classes. And you will be intervened until the kid makes it either to grade level or is sent somewhere else to be assessed for a reading problem. This will not happen with math. You will never be pulled out and sent to anybody if you don't have math. It all falls on the parent. All right, so what fundamental skills are missing that need to be trained? So this is Alexa's new research that she's doing right now in the schools. And it's all based on um, work that we did earlier about grouping kids into these no skills, counting, uh, and, and different skills. What we know, and this goes back to this being a developmental talk, is that kids are coming in with these very different skills. And what we're trying to do is figure out if they're coming in with these different skills, what are they? Can we determine these based for each kid, what skills they are? Her study is to then see, but once we isolate what skills the kids enter school with, what kind of uh, training are they getting from the teachers in the classroom, and whether or not that training shows an increase in math in the next year. So it's another 
In order for us to look at this, we have to do these longitudinal studies, so it takes a while. Um, but the, what we get in the end is that we can actually say temporally what happened along the way. This came first in order to predict this. She's using this new, um, uh, it's kind of an app, uh, and it's kind of interesting. It's actually out there for parents to use, but we're using it for research because what it does is it shows, and I'm going to show you a little picture in a second, it, it shows different types of math things that the kids have to do. Uh, and it, it tells us it's an adaptive test, which means if you get it right or wrong, the computer program determines what's the next thing you see. So a lot of our things like GREs, actually I don't think the GRE, the SAT is adaptive testing now. So if you miss the first something in the first 10, it'll take you a different way than you would have if you'd gotten them all correct. And so it's looking at how you get things wrong and correct is to see what you actually get tested on next. What this tells us is whether or not we have kids that can do subtraction, but not addition, counting, um, but not any higher score, and it does it right in the computer program. So we don't have to go back and code that. It tells us right away for every kid where they are. Then she can observe the classroom, observe the teacher, look at the curriculum, see what they're receiving, and see whether or not that kid, kid's particular issue is addressed, and then whether or not we saw increases in math. Um, so it hasn't been used. This is the first time it's been used in the United States. Um, it just came out, so it's not, not that crazy. Um, and it was used for kids to practice in the home in the Netherlands. So this is an example of video. Unfortunately, it won't play. But it basically, little things show up and tasks come up. So um, you might see a bunch of fish that are in the pond. And it says how many fish are there. And so the kid will count one, two, three, four. Um, and then if they get an answer, then they say, okay, and numbers show up on the right-hand side, and it says, well, tell me how many fish are there. So not only do they have to count, they have to know the numerical representation of what they're doing, and that's testing for two skills. So they may be able to count, but then they can't go and actually find the number, because they don't know what it is, on the other side. So that helps us distinguish between the two skills that they have. For counting. So um, she's using this now. Alexa, how many kids do you have? Over 198. Close. Close. Um, in order to do the testing we do, we have to have a power of a test, so we have to get a certain amount of kids. Um, so she's running it through right now, trying to get the first pretest, getting all these scores um, that we can now use. She'll see what the kids are taught, uh, and then she'll go back and see whether or not uh, these skills get better and whether or not that increases their achievement on these skills. So this is our current way that we're trying to isolate what it is that's happening in the schools that can actually help the kids because we are concerned about this 54-month thing that kids are coming in with different skills and it has a long-term prediction uh, to outcomes for kids. Sorry, this is pretty small, but this is just it, the teacher and the researcher, us, get information immediately by age of what kids are capable of doing and what they're not capable of doing. So this is instant information. We don't have to go back and do what we always usually do, code everything, take you know days and days. Um, and then these like kind of, if it's very good, it's green. Uh, if it's you know average, it's yellow. You can see in this example, um, most of the kids are not doing very well on these early skills. And we're seeing that a little bit. We're, we're, we're actually seeing kids starting entering school as we did in the other study with no skills. Um, so it's not, they can't even count, so there's certainly kids that can't count. Uh, and then we are seeing, and, and we see this, uh, we have a different groups of uh, different socioeconomic status schools. Uh, the kids in the highest ones are doing better at, at school entry than the kids in the other ones. These are, if you think about this, that you get 30 to 32 kids in your classroom and you have this variety of kids with these different skills, how difficult it is to try to teach to these different skills. Uh, and again, get everyone to a proficiency level when they started at such different rates, right? This is a very difficult thing for anyone to do, especially a teacher who's also dealing with lots of other things. Um, but again, we're trying to figure this out to try to help this along. All right, so I wanted to talk briefly um, about what some of the issues are with math skills, what we know. These disparities coming from the home environment, from the things that are done in the home uh, or preschool, 
I can throw in preschool for some kids who, who go to preschool, are creating these disparities early on, these foundational skills, which we haven't fully identified, but at least are somewhere around counting, subtraction, addition, basic skills, uh, kids are coming in quite differential. When they get into the schools, the kids are given math. They're mostly giving, given counting, if you think about calendar time and other types. That's all counting activities. Um, they don't get any higher order math until first or second grade. And if they don't do well in that, they simply go on to the next grade. There's no extra assistance that goes on. But why is math so, seen so differently? It's a basic skill. It runs similarly as reading does. But why is it conceived of so differently as something you don't need to intervene on uh, or other skill? Thoughts? Why is math seen so differently? It is a learned skill. I'll put that out there. You can teach it. In fact, we do. So what I hear all the time, and people are, are starting to use this example, people will, will say to me when they find out I study math, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm not good at math. I don't have a math brain. And my kids aren't good because I'm not good at math. So I think math, unfortunately, has gotten stuck in this situation where people think, one, it's genetically predisposed, whether you're good at math or not. Um, and they think that really that their brain is not capable of doing math. And I can tell you that the organs of our bodies are all made to do what they're supposed to do. And the brain is supposed to learn. That's all it's there to do. Uh, and it can also learn. But I think people have just assumed you're born with some ability to do math that other people are not capable of doing. And this isn't the case. So if you take anything from my talk, it's that we can teach and train math. We do it a lot. Um, we have people in, in homes are teaching it all the time, just like they're doing reading and language. It's not a different skill. Um, but we have to move it away from that belief system that math is somehow special. It's different. And only some people have it and other people don't have it. I think it's been detrimental to our ability to do anything in this country related to math. There have been other countries that uh, have become developed countries focused mostly on training their entire population to do math. And their entire population has learned how to do it. Um, they become engineers, male or female. They all can do it. Uh, and we can do it too. We just have to make it not so special. We just have to make it what it is. It's a skill that you learn and that you can get trained to do. The other issue is that most of our best teachers in math are concentrated in the high school years. That's because it's the pivotal time point for getting into college. And what we know is that we need really good math teachers also in the earliest years. Those are the foundational years. If they don't get the foundation, they're not going to get the later ones. So we have to rethink what we think about early childhood education and what we should be training, and then be excited about the idea that people could be math teachers early on. Again, we have reading specialists. We could have math specialists as well. But we can also have teachers that really enjoy teaching pretty basic math to kids. Um, and right now, most of uh, early schooling, K1, is all about literacy, with just a very little bit of math. And then you get hit really hard in second and third grade on doing math that you haven't really even learned the foundational skills for, right? So it's important for us to get this down. Also to think about developmentally the fact that every kid coming into a classroom or leaving a classroom is not going to be at the same place. People come from different situations in their home environment. They have different stimulation. We have to allow for that flexibility to occur. That just because you've ended first grade, not everyone is going to be at exactly the same place. It doesn't mean they're not going to be there by second. It doesn't mean they're not going to acquire that skill. They just may not acquire it in first grade. And so we have to think about being more flexible about what we think about as first, second, and third grade. Uh, because those are just numbers we created in the schooling. It doesn't mean that that's where kids were naturally always supposed to be. Right? So we have to think a little bit better about that. We're still working on early interventions. They come and they go. Uh, and they don't, they haven't worked so far. But we do need to think more about these individualized ideas. So uh, if you 
talk to my colleague Fred Morrison, he'll say exactly the same thing about reading. People come in, they're individualistic in the way that they learn, they have different skills. You have to target what those skills are and you have to train for those skills. If you don't, kids just get left in the dust. If you don't teach them phonics, they're not going to learn higher order reading. If you don't teach the basic math, they're not going to be doing higher order math. So it's really thinking about those skills and figuring out where the kid is and then addressing the problem of the kid. Um, and I'm going to get a little bit on my soapbox about this because whenever I hear education and I, I when uh, the dean of our education school went up to the state legislature and was talking about schooling and what they needed to do for teacher evaluations, at no point in time were the kids talked about. It was all about how we evaluate the teachers and the schools and what schools are closed. But the kids are the ones sitting in the classroom. That is actually what schools were made for, were to, were to train the kids. And we kind of lose that when we're thinking about all these other political situations going on when we really need to be focused on the kids. Because in this in more and more data heavy country that we're going into, we need people to do math. Those are going to be the jobs of tomorrow it doesn't have to be college educated math. It can be any math. They need to know the basic math in order to get jobs. So we have to think about uh, doing that. And I'll end with, we all have math brains. We're all capable of doing math. And hopefully we'll help you in the next few years <laughs> figure that out. We're trying to figure it out ourselves. Um, and I'm at the end. Thank you for your attention. This program was recorded on November 26, 2018 at the Ann Arbor District Library.